Hey what's up guys it's Oakley and you may have noticed that CA put out an awesome let's play for the Queen and the Crone DLC where they play as both forces of the High Elves under Alerio and then the force of the Dark Elves under Helebron. Uh, so this was pretty awesome. I do recommend you check it out. There's some high production value behind it and it teases a lot of cool things. Uh, just a brief recap that I did want to go over is for Helebron we do get to see a bit of the mechanics behind you know her uh, specifically, and then we see a bit more about the Death Knight mechanic itself. And then Alariel, we see her Defender of Ulthorn mechanic in action. And then finally, towards the end of the video, we do get to see the Sword of Cannon. They talk about it, and it is freaking fantastic. Let's go over the first two. So the first one about Helebron, they talk about her mechanic is really interesting. You're constantly fighting against kind of withering away. So over time, you have this meter where it's going to kind of deplenish. Uh, diminish itself over time and as you get to the lower end of this scale you're gonna have reduced uh, battlefield stats and then also in the campaign you're gonna have big debuffs to public order etc so that's really cool and you're gonna have to replenish yourself mostly mostly through sacrifice uh, and bloodshed to try and um, use that essential dark magic to to regenerate yourself so that's pretty cool so once you do kind of increase this you can do it through these death knights um, that's one of the mechanics. Uh, but then another way that you can kind of try and replenish her uh, self or keep herself from withering away is going to be by capturing these two key cities. You can either capture the ancient city of Quintex or gain Veil vale in Ulthuan itself. So what these will do is once you conquer either of these, it'll kind of set a minimum cap to how much you can wither away. So that's nice. Uh, and I like how this whole campaign mechanic is focused really around this single character seeking to have this eternal life essentially and become more and more powerful. Uh, really brings the spotlight on Helebron. Uh, and then the Death Knight mechanic that we mentioned here is basically you perform this large sacrifice it takes a certain number of slaves and over time the more times you do it it increase the cost of slaves to do it but when you trigger the death uh, knight essentially what you get is a big buff so I think it does replenish Hellbron's kind of uh, withering meter and then it also increases loyalty for lords vigor loss reduction uh, physical resistance goes up for herself and the witch elves uh, you get public order buffs etc all kinds of stuff another cool thing as well is once you pop this death knight you get a blood voyage which lasts for 15 turns and essentially what this is is it's going to be a doom stack that appears uh, presumably it's people you know coming to this death knight heeding the call and going on a rampage so like I said it's um, it's a doom stack that spawns you have con uh, or it's controlled for 15 turns and the AI is actually going to be the one that controls it it seems like this blood voyage army is going to be given autopilot orders where it immediately goes and tries to attack ult one now, if Ulthuan is already under your control and you do spawn a Blood Voyage army, then it goes into your control and you can choose what to do with it. So that's kind of interesting. In a head-to-head -head campaign, you actually get control over it. And that's what they're showing in the video itself. So that's kind of a, a cool little mechanic. Another interesting thing about this Blood Voyage army is it's pretty well kitted out. It's got some pretty good uh, units on it. And then it has some pretty interesting stats. Uh, the unit upkeep for those horses is significantly reduced. And all the units are unbreakable. No matter what the unit is, it's going to be unbreakable. So this thing is going to hit like a truck. People are going to fight to their last. It's going to do so much damage. At the same time, uh, this army cannot be replenished. So yeah, it'll stick to the last on the battlefield. But also, you know, whatever, you know, if they stand and fight, they're not going to be able to replenish those ranks and have an infinitely unbreakable unit. It'll eventually wither away to, you know, uh, nigh unusableness. So that's going to be an interesting mechanic behind that. Uh, next, they show us a little bit of Alariel, Defender of Ulthuan mechanic. So as we've heard before, basically she gets buffs for securing more of Ulthuan behind herself and the High Elves, and debuffs if the enemy controls it. So we get to see a little bit of that in, uh, in action. So, you know, when she's doing well, global public order is going to increase, income is going to increase, construction costs and diplomatic relations, penalships decrease. Uh, so all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I did see a, a hint at perhaps there's different mechanics behind, you know, the inner ring of Ulth 1 versus the outer ring. I think controlling the inner ring is much more important than the outer ring. Um, has less of an impact on this mechanic. Uh, another really cool thing as well is that there's specific buffs for the cities and settlements that she visits. So when she goes to a settlement, uh, that specific settlement will get public order growth uh, buffs and they'll be untainted and the Winds of Magic buffs will go up for 10 turns. So that's really cool. A mechanic specifically geared around the location of your lord and you can kind of it incentivizes essentially Alariel from ping-ponging around between settlements and this is really cool stuff something that i really hope that ca will think about porting over to future historical titles 
I mean, you'd imagine, you know, if you move around your king to various settlements or, or some sort of local ruler, maybe it's a governor, it could raise the public order or recruitment bonuses or drive down recruitment costs. That would be really cool uh, to see something like that implemented historically. But yeah, that's it for the mechanics of these two uh, legendary lords and their factions. I'm sure there'll be a lot more over time that we'll get to see. Uh, but the next thing I did want to get to is going to be the Sword of Cain. So this is really cool. It's a specific location on the map uh, close to Ulthuan. And basically what happens if you control the region, uh, then you can pick up this uh, sword out of the Shrine of Cain. Uh, actually, you have to build first a landmark building, and then you can pick up the sword. Uh, the wielder of this sword gets ridiculous bonuses. So wielding the sword gives you uh, 450 armor-piercing damage, plus 25 melee attack, plus 20% ward save. It makes you unbreakable. Uh, you have some special magic attacks and a bound vortex spell. Uh, so the magic attack, I believe, will give you Mattis of Cain on your targets, which means they'll rampage. And then the Vortex spell does a lot of armor-piercing damage. So this thing is super powerful. 450 AP damage is insane. And essentially, what they told you as well is this is just where the sword starts. Over time, it'll get more and more powerful the more you use it. So you can imagine this thing will scale up splendidly. So I'm glad CA has gone really overboard made a super OP weapon. But alongside it, what happens is you get debuffs. And these are not just debuffs for your, you know, whoever is wielding it, but it's for your entire faction. So you'll get global public order uh, penalties as well as diplomatic penalties. And so, you know, as the sword gets more and more powerful, so too will these uh, public order debuffs. So yeah, that's going to be really, really interesting. I'm super excited that they have this implemented. Uh, CA did say that it is a sword that can be picked up by both the Dark Elves and the High Elves. It's going to be included in Eye of the Vortex campaign. And I don't know if that means that any faction can wield it. I know a lot of people in the forums are giddy about giving it to Grimgore or maybe even giving it to, to Queek and other forces. It would be very interesting. So we'll have to see more about that. But I am very pleased that they've made this um, such a unique mechanic. And I would love to see them introduce more weapons like this in the campaign. More crazy stuff uh, as time goes on because it definitely adds a lot of flavor. So yeah, that's it for the recap for the Let's Play. At this point, I've talked almost as long as the Let's Play itself, so I definitely recommend that you check it out for more little morsels and tidbits of information. But yeah, that's it for the recap. Stay tuned for more, and I will see you in the next one. Peace out.